Okay, so welcome to our free LSAT prep hour for August 4th, 2020. Uh, my name is Dimitri, um, and our topic for today is going to be going fast. So I'm going to talk about uh, a few speed strategies that you can use to just make everything go a little bit faster, a little bit easier on the LSAT. We'll talk about front loading, which to me is the single most important thing. Getting, you know, it's spend money to make money kind of thing. Spend time in the right place and you'll go much faster. Uh, make good predictions is a big part of that. And then on the back end, recognize bad answers watch out for unneeded work and throughout this test get used to thinking in conditionals whether you're brand new to conditional logic or you've been doing it a while you can always get more fluent and some of my top scoring students folks who are getting 172 175 179 what have you um still find that they can fine-tune how they think about conditionals so we'll talk about that a little bit too okay um so i want to run through uh some principles for each of these areas um but before we do Curious what you think, why is speed important? Aside from the obvious fact that this is a time test, why else do you think it's important that we learn to do whatever we're doing fairly quickly? Any ideas? Absolutely, saving time for harder questions is a is a big part of it. So not only, of course, do we want to finish on time if we can, and you know, get through all the questions, but the, not all questions are created equal. So we don't simply want to say, "Oh, good, number five, I got it right." We want to say, "Hey, if number five wasn't that hard for me, can I get it right faster so I have more time to spend on the harder questions?" Right. Uh, so you know, uh, so it's you know, it's valuable. Uh, to get to everything, right, if we can. Although we don't always want to do all the questions, right, especially depending on our score goals and our, and our strength of the material, there might be things that we'd like to go. But uh, yeah, we want to save time for the harder questions. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the secret like <laughs> keys that a lot of people don't realize to doing well on hard material. It's not just, you know, being the smartest and the best prepared. It's also just doing the easy things more easily. And if you can do the easy things more easily, then you have room for those other things in your life. Right. Any other reasons we might want to get, get faster? A couple other things I can think about is just in terms of like breathing room and confidence. Do I feel good about what I'm doing? Am I, am I relaxed? A lot of people tell me that on test day, they kind of freaked out and we're trying to avoid that if at all possible. And the more you can feel not just that you're able to do these, but that you can do some of them very fluently and quickly and easily. Again, that just saves not just time, but it saves mental energy and it lowers your stress, right? Um, my goal when I take an LSAT LR section, for instance, is I want to get the first 15 right in 15 minutes. That's hard to do. It's an aggressive timeline, but I do it. And one of the reasons I'm able to do it is that for at least a fair amount of what I'm seeing, it's quite routine. I see the question, I know what to expect, and I go, ooh, that one, right? And that happens some of the time. Does it happen on every single question, right? Do I finish the entire LSAT very, very quickly? Without No. I, I have a lot of work I have to do. Uh, but when, because I can do some of the easier things very routinely, I have room to, to think, and I also just feel more confident and comfortable throughout the test. Um, so that, that I think is, is uh, very important. The other thing is that often hard tasks are often just combinations of easier tasks. Uh, you know, they're not going to ask us to figure out quantum physics on this test, right? They're, they're going to take things that we know how to do and just pile them up. And so often that's, that's what's going on. And so if I can do the things that are currently just doable, if I can get them to the point where they're easy and fast, then often I can put those together and think about something that would otherwise be just too much for me to do in, in, the, in the time allotted. I got a question in, um, should we do all of our practice timed? Um, if you're just starting out, on the LSAT, or if you're just starting out on a particular topic, I think it's fine to initially do the work untimed. But once you're kind of familiar with the task, I do recommend that you always practice timed, um, but then review untimed. So you do a set of problems, and then you go back through and say, okay, I'm pretty sure the answer is B, but before I find out, uh, why isn't it A? Why isn't it C? Could I have predicted this? Is there a way I could have handled this better? Um, if I check my work then and find out I'm wrong, what did I miss? Can I figure it out? Um, if, I, if I was unsure, but then it turns out I'm right, I was down to two, maybe. I hear that a lot. People will tell me, I get it down to two, and I always pick the wrong one. Well, 
but what was that distinction? What did you miss? And do you really always pick the wrong one? Or when you get it right, do you just assume you were fine and not think about how can I make that more effortless? How can I make that easier? So long term, you should get used to doing time practice, but follow up with untimed practice that helps you make those faster split second decisions. It's the way an athlete might know that they have to work very quickly. You know, you, do you hit the ball or do you not hit the ball? Do you, you know, do you, do you pass or do you, or do you keep going, right? But you look back maybe at a recording of yourself and say, how could I have made a better call and why should I have known that? Is there a way I could have known? And that's a big part of it. So this is why we want to get better. Uh, or why we want to get faster. Um, let's look at some, some ways to actually do that. So like I said, probably the most important thing of all on this test um, is front loading. Do that work up front that makes your job easier. And so I want to show how that works across all of our major topics. Um, in logic games, as you probably know, um, a lot of it's just about visualizing the game. Do I understand, uh, um, do I understand what the question is, is asking? Um, Sorry, what, I'm talking about questions now. Do I understand what the game is asking me to do? Do I understand the setup? Um, sometimes what happens is we get so caught up in uh, the minutiae of one particular rule that we don't back up and say, what should this game look like? Is it a number line? Is it a circle of some kind? Is it a, you know, what kind of chart is it? Do I want a, uh, a set of in-out conditional rules? Um, really understand that up front. Sometimes in class, students will ask me, do we know this or, you know, can, can there be more than one person per day in this diagram? And I don't have the answers, only the game has the answers. So get used to making sure you have that. Often this also means slowing down on the first couple of questions. Um, the orientation question at the beginning that tests your understanding of the rules and maybe the first one or two questions after that, that are really a way of seeing, did I understand this game? Use those to set up your success. Make sure that you're not too surprised. If it seems like you're supposed to know a lot of things that you don't know, maybe there's something you missed. Some of the easiest games are, can look very hard if we don't do the upfront work. I had a student who was scoring very high ask me for help with a game that I consider the easiest LSAT game of all time. And this is not a student who is struggling with the content. It was simply, it was a game where if you do the upfront inferences, the game is easy. You, it's, it's a rare game. It's in Prep Test 35 if you want to check it out. I won't tell you which game, haha. Uh, but one of the games in there, if you do that front work, you know basically everything but one thing. Um, so if that student had done that work, they would have gotten pretty much all right. And so you just have to back up and, and make sure you're catching when those things are there. Use frames and framey thinking. Frames are a way of describing when you have a clear situation where, oh, either J or K goes on Monday. And if J happens, if J goes on Monday, this happens. And if K goes on Monday, this happens. Not all games are frameable. Many, many games are not frameable. Probably more than half are not really clearly frameable. But we can also use frame-related thinking. Do I know something about what happens if J goes on Monday, even if I don't know what happens when J doesn't? Um, do I know something about the numbering possibilities? Do I know what elements are going to have a really large effect on how the game works out? So without spending 20 minutes diagramming all the possibilities, can I spend a minute up front just thinking about where this game is going and, and what kinds of things I'm going to need to know? That's very important. Um, on the reading comp side, a lot of this is having a perspective, read through a lens. In our book, we talk about reading for the scale, which basically means what's the underlying argument? Uh, what is the passage getting at? Um, what's the debate or uh, you know, change that we see? Maybe it was there's a new theory and an old theory and they're talking about the merits of the new one as opposed to the old. Or there's you know, the liberals and conservatives are, are feuding and where does the author stand on this? Um, but sometimes it's more subtle than that. Uh, and it's really just a sense of, what kind of approach is the author taking and how does that allow us to read the rest? Often this allows us to speed up because once I have a sense of where the passage is going, I can, I can kind of see what the rest of the passage is, is doing. So lean on the opening sentences, both of the passage and of the individual paragraphs. For students who are really struggling, every now and then, uh, let me know if you've had this experience, every now and then I'll have a student who says, look, English is not my native language. Uh, I really struggle to understand just what the passages are saying. And if I try to read for really strong comprehension, it takes me five, eight, 10 minutes to read the passage and I can't afford that. Um, and I've had some fair amount of success with students just having them read less of the passage. Um, one thing that people will do is they'll just try reading the, in, the first sentence of each paragraph, or in some cases, the first and last. Now, does it, is this a secret trick that always works? No, but it's actually very effective. And you might be surprised. It would be interesting to compare that to what you're actually doing. You might be surprised how often when we just read the first sentence of each paragraph or the first and last sentence of each paragraph, we can actually get a fair idea of what's going on. 
It'd be like if you sort of skip through a movie watching little pieces of it. Over time, you'd say, oh, well, it seems to be at least two, and I think there are a couple, but looks like then for a while, so one of them was with someone else. And you know, you get, a, you get a sense of what kind of movie, it, or this is an action movie. There's lots of punching and kicking, right? Um, uh, but with, with reading comms, since you can actually you know, read the words rather than just watching scenes, um, you can often get a pretty good sense of where the passage is going, because these are very well structured. So, most of us are gonna end up reading all the words, and we should, but we might read with variable speed. And so really lean and dig into those opening sentences and make sure you understand. And often that will make the rest of your job easier. Um, for instance, let's say the passage starts with something like, oh, I'll come back to this. Oh yeah, I'll add that in. You speed up when you know what you have. So if you know kind of where it's going, you can speed up. So may, they might start with something like this. Uh, you know, simple initial stimuli can lead to very complex outcomes or something like that. Okay, so I might stop and think about that abstraction for a second. What are they saying? And then they give you for an example. They say, for example, you know, when you switch on your microwave oven, the scattering of the electrons across the plate causes a blah, 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 blah on a differential, and maybe it starts to lose you. I don't know this much science. I'm confused about what they're talking about. But if I can know that basically what they're describing is a simple thing that leads to a complex thing, then I don't need to dig in that hard. And I can always come back if they ask me about that and see if I can if I can find an answer. But for now, I can just say, oh, here's an example of a simple thing that leads to a complex thing. Got it. Okay, I can move on. So if you know what it's doing there, right? If you know that I'm, I don't know, saying that our congressperson shouldn't be reelected, and then I list some things they did, you could probably guess what they are, things that the congressperson did that I don't like. Okay, you know what that's doing. If I say that there was an increase in crime despite attempts to, to decrease crime, and then I show examples, you know, okay, these are going to be crimes, right? And so I can, I can, you know, not dig in as much there, and I'll go back there if I need it. Some people have this almost savant-like recall. They tell me everything from the passage, but they didn't get the big picture, and then they're really losing out. So, so push on that big picture, uh, and you can always come back for the details. So that's, that's very important. Let me look for questions. Um, I always try to write a scale, but sometimes if I initially write the scale wrong, it costs me more time. Yeah, so what you wanna do there, and we'll talk in a minute about using prediction to help you, but the idea is you can be wrong, you have to be ready to adjust, right? Think about you're watching a movie, and maybe you have a pretty good sense of what's going on in the movie, right? Um, the main character is a spy that works for the US government, and they're trying to stop the bad guys. But then maybe you adjust and it becomes interesting. Wait, are they really working for the US government? Or are they actually a double agent and the movie hasn't revealed that yet? Or is the boss actually one of the bad guys? And you know, what else is going on? Or is this all you know, happening inside cyberspace and, and none of this is really real because the person died? Or you know, is it turns into science fiction? Or what seems like a simple love story gets complicated when one of the, it takes a turn we didn't expect and it turns into more of a, a scary story or, or more of a complex story. Um, and so we, we need to be ready to revise our, our sense of the scale. But I think, so you don't have to commit to it. We make a distinction in our book between reading for the scale and reading through the scale. Reading for the scale is trying to figure out what's the debate here, what's the issue. Reading through the scale is saying, hey, now that I know the issue, what do I do with this? Some passages will be pretty upfront and clear with their scale from the beginning. They might just flat out say, hey, this new approach is better than the old one. Okay, I, I get it now. <laughs> They're gonna show why the new approach is better than the old one. Sometimes they might show potential advantages of a new approach and then by the end you realize that they're in favor of the old one or they're transcending that scale and saying no, the new and the old one both have the same principles, right? Like what if someone's complaining about the Republicans and you think, oh, they're a Democrat and they say, yeah, but the Democrats are the same. We actually want some other party. Ah, okay, they don't like either side. Um, so we have to be ready to jump up uh, a level in a way. Another question is, do, I, do you recommend answering all questions even if you have to guess? Uh, yeah, to me, if you don't answer all the questions, you're not serious. You have to answer all the questions. Um, there's no penalty for guessing and your chance of getting them right is at least one out of five, more if you can eliminate something as we'll talk about. So yeah, you, you have to answer all the questions no matter what, otherwise you're just giving away points. Um, and if that means you have to let some things go, that's part of, that's part of our speed effort, right? Not getting hung up on individual questions that, that take us too long and, and make us miss more. Uh, and what we'll sometimes see is the difficulty scale actually tails off at the end. The, the questions get harder and then they get a little easier and then they get harder again and then they get a little easier. And if we spend way too much time up here at the top, we might miss a few questions at the end that we could more easily have gotten. Um, in, in logical reasoning, a couple things in terms of front loading. One is make sure we know what the question type is. Our goal is gonna vary quite a bit if they're simply asking us for the conclusion. 
versus asking us to justify how the conclusion uh, can be can be arrived at from the premises given, or asking us to use what we're reading um, to support an inference. And so we need to know what our goal is so we know how to read the passage, right? Just like uh, you might you might review a case file very differently if you're say um, going to defend a, a client in, in this case versus use this case to try to find a precedent for some other case. Those are very different ways of viewing the same information, even if you get a lot of the same particulars out of it. Um, we also want to get used to really seeing the structure, right? In other words, um, on a identify the conclusion, you know, how do I see that the words, whether it's the obvious things like therefore or because that indicate a conclusion or indicate a premise, or more broadly, just getting a quick sense of, of where everything is in the argument so that we're more readily able to assess the logic. And so the better you get at reading for structure, identifying keywords that point to parts of the structure, seeing how one thing can follow from the other, it's gonna make things much faster. So don't skimp on that side of things, um, both in your preparation and in your work on individual questions. Make sure that you're, you're, you're looking at, at, at a broad picture when you're, when you're doing a logical reasoning argument, not just kind of getting hung up in individual vocabulary words. Um, yeah, there, there's certainly a, a uh, the question was, does that mean reading the question stem first? There's some controversy about that. I've had very successful test takers who don't read the question stem first. I don't get why they wouldn't though. To me, I want to know what my task is, and I'm going to read the argument differently depending on what it is. I mean, there's such a big difference from make an inference where I'm simply saying what is true. I'm granting everything I'm reading is true versus, you know, what would be a sufficient assumption and I'm looking for the single hole that I need to fill in. So to me, I can't imagine waiting to read the question, but uh, you know, your views may vary. Um, I think one way or the other, you wanna make sure that your goal is clear. If that means that you're waiting until you've, uh, you've read the argument and then you go to the question, still make sure you've clarified your goal before you go into the answers. Okay, other questions about these parts of it? We'll do some questions in just a little bit, but another part of front loading has to do with making predictions. So I wanna talk about how to make predictions or how to use prediction uh, across the topic, uh, across all the topics. So in general, one thing that's really important is get used to making inference as you go. As you go. I mean, it could be as simple as, uh, you know, uh, a conditional where they say, if A, then B, and then they say, you know, uh, Jenny is an A, all right, well then B, right? Jenny is also a B or Jenny, B also applies to Jenny, right? So we can say, ooh, I've triggered that conditional and that, therefore I know that. Um, but sort of use that as part of your process of making predictions. Notice when things come together and don't wait until the end to go, hmm, what do I know? To go faster, you want to get in the habit of noticing it as you go. Just like you might if you're reading a book or watching a movie. You don't wait until the end to go, oh, interesting. You, things pop up, you go, wait a minute. Didn't he say that? And now, and you're and you're you're staying awake the whole time, and you're trying to make those predictions. You're trying to make connections the whole thing you go. Um, uh, good question. I'll come back to that question in just a moment. Um, on logic games in particular, a really good use of prediction is making question-specific frames. So um, you don't always do this, but when they say something like, uh, "If Joe is not selected first, uh, then you know which of the following could be true or something like that. There are cases where you'll say, oh, well then there's two places Joe can go. If Joe's not first, I know he's second or third because the, it said the latest he can go is third. So let's see if I know what happens when Joe's second. Let's see if I know what happens when Joe's third. Maybe I didn't have that in initial frames, but maybe I can use that really quickly to, to knock this out. So sometimes there are cases where I can I can make some really short work of the, of the upfront uh, ideas and have, um, have something going in there. Okay. Um, other things I can do on, on logic games in terms of making predictions, choose a good starting point for, for uh, you know, what I want to work with. Um, if they've said something like, Joe isn't first and there's lots of things that could happen, I might want to think about, well, do I want to try to throw him in to see what could happen? Do I want to look at an answer choice? And if so, is there a good answer choice to start with? So really think about where my, my energy is best put before I just start doing a lot of work. And that'll come to one of our later principles, which is try to avoid unnecessary work. You also want to think about what your clearest route to a good answer is, proving versus disproving. And this is central to the test, not just in logic games, but, but sometimes in LR and RC as well. The idea of, am I, am I going to be able to produce, prove a specific answer or do I have to knock out four? Obviously, if I can prove one answer, that's often going to be easier. So if they say, what must be true? 
and I know that you know x x is out or something like that, then I'm going to look for that in the answer choices. Um, if I don't see that, I might have to just disprove the others and say, hey, it doesn't have to be true that A is happening, or at least not disprove, but show that they can be violated, right? X doesn't have to be out or something like that. Um, in other cases, um, there's not much to prove, and disproving is, is sort of the, the natural way to go. Or maybe I'm looking for something that must be false, and I'm looking and saying, is there anything that, that's clearly false? So kind of trying to decide when I'm working process of elimination and when I can go straight to an answer is a big part of prediction on this test. Um, on the reading comp side of things, one big way to use prediction is during your reading. And this is what I was saying about, about following the plot of a story. Think about where this is going, even if you're going to be wrong. And this gets back to the earlier comment about you, about revising your scale as you go. Um, you can be wrong and still get something out of it. Maybe you're watching a movie and go, oh, I get it. I get how he's managing to do in two places at once. It's identical twins. It's not just one person. You could be totally wrong, but you're thinking about things. You're engaging. You're, you're producing hypotheses. And then when they're, say, disproven or something else happens, you're much more engaged. It also allows you to move faster because when your predictions are proven true, you can read a little faster. You could say, oh, I bet they're gonna do something like this. Oh yeah, they're doing that. Or, oh, I think this is just an example. Is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so when things conform to your expectations and when things are making sense, you can go faster. It's the same thing we see in logic games where the answers are fitting what we think. We know we have a better handle on this game than when the answers are a big surprise. So if everything we're reading is a big surprise, I might need to slow down and make sure I understand what the passage is talking about. Um, I want to expect most answers to be predictable. And so here I want to cycle back to a question I got in the chat, which is, um, should, I, should I always be going back to the passage to clarify confusion when answering questions? I would take it further than that. Don't go back to the passage to clarify confusion. Expect to go back to the passage for every question that's not a very general one. Every question. So if they ask, what's the main point of the passage? What's the author's overall perspective? What's the primary purpose? Those kind of questions. Sure, you, you ideally would already have that figured out and you wouldn't need to go back to the passage, although you certainly could if you, if you want to clarify. Um, but when they ask you something more specific, you know, which of the following is listed as a security advantage of distributed networks? Or you know, why does the author mention pygmy marmosets on line 17? Or which of the following is not mentioned as an advantage of method C or something like that? Um, we should go back. Do not expect to do it from memory. And if you're trying to do things from memory, it's going to put too much pressure on you to read really slowly and thoroughly. But the passage isn't going to be taken away from you. It's an open book test. It's like anything. It's you more want to know how to use the tools. Think about if you were taking a, a, a chemistry test and you knew you'd get to have a copy of the periodic table. Well, then you don't need to memorize the periodic table. If you happen to have memorized it, you know, good for you. But you might want to check to make sure you're right. But you would probably want to know how to use the periodic table. What does it mean? What are these numbers? What do they stand for? Um, that would become important. And so the same thing when you're reading a passage. You just want to know how to use the passage. Where are the parts? What am I doing with them? Where should I look when I have a question? Um, but I don't necessarily need to know all the information. And that's, that's an important distinction. But expect that most answers, not all, but most answers on reading comp will be predictable. In logic games, it's probably the exception that answers are super predictable. Sometimes you'll have one, they'll just say, what must be true? And you're like, ooh, I figured something out. Um, that'll happen. But a lot of the times, the answers won't be strictly predictable, at least not without some extra work. On reading comp, you want to look into the question and say, all right, where is the support? What should the answer look like? And I should have at least an idea of what I'm looking for in the answers. OK, so that should be kind of the norm or the default on reading comp. On logical reasoning, it'll often be predictable. Uh, when you're dealing with the assumption family, uh, assumption, strengthen, weaken, uh, principle, example, flaw, we want to find that premise conclusion mismatch and use that to, to make a prediction. And we want to fit our prediction to the exact question type that we're given. So um, if they're asking me to weaken, I might want to go as far as saying, well, they're assuming that you know the the plane will leave on time, and so to weaken it, I would want to say something that would show that the plane would leave later. There would be some kind of delay. Okay, I want something like that, and that might seem like too much work. You know the idea. Okay, they're assuming the plane leaves on time, but it's so easy to get turned around, whether it's an accept question or simply going the opposite of what you expected. Um, it's really common to fall for traps on that. So stop and and explicitly uh, predict what you want. Sometimes that gets really tough on, say, a flaw question where there are different types. Some of the answers are describing a, uh, an assumption by saying the argument, uh, you know, uh, takes for granted or uh, 
assumes without justification. Other times they're pointing out a flaw or weakness by saying something like uh, fails to consider something or neglects a possibility. And you have to recognize the difference in language you might see um, than in the answer choices. Um, on logical reasoning, you pretty much want to have a prediction every time. There certainly be, can be surprises and there can be answers you didn't predict. And your predictions, again, don't have to be super specific. If, I'm, if I know that a weekend will be the, that the plane will leave late, I don't have to know why the plane will leave late. Maybe the answer says, you know, uh, whatever, the, the, the plane's engine broke down or um, there was a high ranking diplomat who needed to be brought on board and they were you know, running late or something like that. I wouldn't have thought of that, but I want to have the general idea of I'm looking for some form of delay or I'm looking for some disadvantage of a particular method or something like that, even if I don't know exactly why. And fit your prediction to the task, reword it as needed to fit the task. Okay, I got a general question. What's the best way to frame your studying if you're just starting out? Definitely get a strategy guide of some kind. It could be ours, it could be someone else's, but, but have a book to study from. Don't just do LSAT problems. You want strategies. Um, I recommend sort of a, my standard default is two hours a day. Um, some people like a day off, some people don't. Um, I'm, I'm not picky about that one way or the other. Do what works for you. Make sure you're staying sane especially in these times. Um, but that's sort of the default, but it can vary. I have students who are studying five hours a day because this is the main thing they're doing and they're not working right now. I have students who are, you know, have some days where they're working too much and they can't fit it in and they're pushing it a little bit more on weekends. But you don't want to just do it two days a week. You want to get it in as, as, you know, as close to six, seven days a week as you, as you can. Uh. Oh, and I, I just saw in the chat, people are talking about reading questions first or RC versus LR. Yeah, that's very important. When I'm talking about reading the question first, I'm specifically talking about logical reasoning. Um, in, in reading comp, um, you don't want to try to read all the questions first. There's way too much for that. Um, you already have a task. Um, which is to understand the overall author's point and the, and the structure, and that's enough. There's a bunch of questions you wouldn't want to try to memorize them and look for those in advance, but do look at each question and make a prediction before hitting the answer choices. Um, I have some other more general questions I'm gonna hold for now, so uh, don't think you're being ignored. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll discuss at the end. Um, so if there are broader questions that aren't about this, I'll, I'll, I can come to those at the end. Um, all right, so I'll leave those in the Q&A. Okay, so making predictions is an important part of things. So let's let's uh, try doing a bit of this. Um, so those of you who are who are new to the LSAT might not feel a hundred percent comfortable with this, um, but take a moment to read this question over and see if you can identify what's wrong with the argument. So just take a moment, read it over. Um, and then we'll discuss. Okay, does anyone know how to name this kind of argument? Do you know, oh, sorry, not this kind of argument, this kind of question? What kind of question do we have here? Yeah, this is a match the flaw, right? And the idea is the way we can tell is they, they talk about a flawed pattern of reasoning. They, could, they don't have to use the word flaw. They could have said questionable pattern of reasoning or mistaken reasoning. Um, and they're asking it to be similar to something we'll see in the answer choices. So we can expect in the answer choices is five more arguments. So this is six for the price of one. If you're just starting out, if you have trouble with pacing, you might just choose not to do this argument at all. And that's <laughs> that was life choice for sure, um, because you can expect that it's gonna take a reasonable amount of time. However, this is a problem that if you're comfortable, you might actually do in only about a minute. Why? Because you're going to skip some of the reading and look actively for what it is you want. And so prediction can allow you to be much, much faster. And I've seen someone already uh, get it what the flaw is. So Cece, you're saying this is a mistaken reversal. And that's exactly right. Um, if we look at this, if we think of this in terms of conditionals, and we'll talk more about conditionals in a moment. 
But the idea is they're saying invariably, anything that's invariable means that it's absolute, it's always true. Um, so they're saying that paleomycologists, and then they define what that is, but we don't really care. So paleomycologists are always acquainted with others, you know, other paleomycologists, right? And they said, uh, it's kind of mean, they have paleomycologists and they have Professor Mansour, which also I would abbreviate as PM. <laughs> so that's kind of tough, but I might say, okay, uh, Mansour is acquainted and they say, so Mansour is a paleomycologist. And so what they're, they're, what they're relying on is a mistaken reversal. They're saying, wait a minute, if, if being a paleomycologist makes you acquainted, does that mean to be acquainted, you have to be a paleomycologist, right? If, if people who live in France speak French, does that mean that people who speak French live in France? Oh, not necessarily, right? There's plenty of people around the world who speak French. Um, and so we wanna watch out for that mistaken reversal. That's the, that's the problem we have. And so we can expect that in our answer. Um, it won't say anything about paleomycologists. It's gonna be a completely different uh, argument, but we can have, we need to look for something where they flip things around. They say, hey, if A then B, now I'm gonna rely on B therefore A. And so one thing you can tell is that they're gonna conclude something that was in what we'd call the sufficient condition that was on the left of the arrow, for those who are familiar with that. So let's, uh, let's put this up and see if we can find an answer. So we want, to, I'll, I'll put all our work over here on the left. One something that matches this. So pull this in when you're ready. Okay, if you're not sure yet, go ahead and uh, pull in an answer. Even if it's a guess, we want to get in the habit of, of doing that. Okay, so initially I saw a lot of folks getting stuck on this one, um, but now I'm seeing a little more favorite uh, you know, favoritism on the, the correct answer, but we have all five answers represented. So I'm not gonna pretend that this is a super easy question and, and, and we're set for life on this, but we do wanna get used to being able to predict. So I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment because it crashed, let me put this back up. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I saw a lot of different uh, versions of the answer, but what we wanna think about is we want something that reverses the logic. And, and as you can see, there's a lot of work to be done in the answer choices because there are all these long things about global airlines. And it's funny because some people really don't like when there's five answers, uh, sorry, yeah, five arguments and the answers about five different topics. But sometimes it's even worse when they're all about the same because by the time you get to like B or C, they all start to blend together in your head. Um, and so what we want is something, again, that relies on a reversal. So um, one thing that we'll get to in a, in a few minutes is, is thinking in terms of conditionals without having to diagram. Um, and ideally, you would be able to do this entire problem without diagramming. If you're just getting started, that's probably asking a lot. Um, and again, this, this entire problem might be asking a lot. As you get more comfortable, you might be able to do more of this in your head. It doesn't mean that you must do it in your head, but if you're able to, it allows you to speed up. Um, 
So if we look at this one, we're saying, okay, when a flight on global airlines is delayed, so if global is delayed, then, you know, uh, and you can decide how you want to abbreviate it, but basically connecting in global is also delayed. Um, and then they're saying uh, connecting global delayed. So uh, her first flight must have been uh, that as well. Um, does this fit what we want? What do we think? I'm seeing a couple answers. Curious what everyone else thinks. Does this, does this reverse the arrow? Yeah, believe it or not, this one's it, right? Now, I wish I could say that, that one of my cool speed techniques is pick A and move on, right? <laughs> I wish, right? A is only the answer one fifth of the time. And when the answer is A, I still do wanna look at the other answer choices just to verify. On logic games, if I'm very confident, if, if they say, you know, what must be true, and I know X isn't first, and A says X isn't first, I'll pick it and move on. Um, but beyond that, I, I'll, I'll check all five on logic games, and I'll certainly do it on LR and RC, even when I'm very confident, because sometimes I'll see an answer that seems perfect until I see an answer that's just like it. It'd be like if later on I showed you a picture and said, is this me? Um, and you said, yeah, okay, cool. Now I say, which of these pictures is me? You see one, it looks like me. And then you go forward and you see another one that looks like me too. And you go, oh, does he have a twin? Does he have someone who looks just like him? Now I've got to really distinguish. So sometimes there are answers that look very close and we have to watch out. Um, but this is actually the only one that reverse, relies on reversal. I'm not going to diagram all of them right now, uh, but just to get an idea. Um, this one talks about, notice that the conditional ends in working harder and this ends in not working harder. So this is a related flaw. Logically, it's equivalent, but it's phrased differently, right? This is saying basically, if miss, then work harder. And this is saying not miss, so not work harder. And if you know about the contrapositive, we could contrapose this to be an illegal reversal, but it's not phrased the same way. It's not coming to this, it's not drawing the same conclusion. Um, it's not drawing a conclusion that was our original sufficient condition, right? Um, notice some of these, uh, don't even come from what we want. So for instance, C goes from something about prices and expenses and income, and then they go to a conclusion about profit unrelated to what they talked about. We don't have that conditional. I don't have to think about it. Um, this goes from whether someone can uh, participate for to uh, knowing that someone does participate. That's not the kind of, of reasoning we have at all. Right? Um, and then this says global must follow suit or lose passengers. The or here is very important. Um, and then this says it rules out an or and gives us another thing. We don't have to assess whether they've done that correctly or not. We can waste, we waste time doing that. We don't need to. I can simply say, hey, choosing between two possibilities and narrowing them down isn't what the original did. So whether E is right or wrong, I don't care. I honestly, I, I don't even know. I haven't thought about it enough. I, I literally do not know whether he is correct. So if you do, you're ahead of me um, because I haven't wasted time thinking about it. That's not the kind of reasoning they're doing. I know A is, I don't have to think about E anymore. Okay. Question was, how do you train to do yourself to do this mentally as opposed to diagramming? That's the trick, isn't it? It definitely takes some time. I was talking to my wife, to my wife about my plans for this workshop and she's saying, just make sure it's not a, a an hour of you, you know, showing how you think and telling other people they should do that, right? Like basically, look how good at the LSAT I am. That's not helpful, right? I obviously want you to train up to so that you are doing this. Um, and so I think what's really important is um, that you do need to spend some time diagramming, but the idea is get it to the point where you don't have to think about it, right? It's like if someone asks me if I know how to read music, it depends on what they mean. If they mean, can you look at the sheet and, and find out what that note is? Yeah, I can do that, I have that skill. I know enough about music to go, ooh, that's an A, ooh, A sharp, right? Um, but if you sit me down at the piano and say, play this, oh, that's another story, I can't do that. Um, and so I'm not a sight reader, but I have the underlying skills. For LSAT, you wanna be a sight reader. You wanna know conditional logic so well that you recognize when it's being used, even when they're not getting into, into detail about it. Does that make sense? 
Um, and then CC saying felt good about A, but felt compelled to check all the other choices. You've got to you've got to play the odds. And so if you feel really good about A, and you realize it's taking way too much time to do the others, you say, look, I may be wrong, but is it worth another minute or two of of looking at all these in detail to make sure? Only if you're getting to the point where you're barely missing any. If you if you tend to only miss one or two mo at most on logical reasoning, then maybe, and you have the time, then maybe it's worth it. But if you often miss seven or eight or 10, uh, it's definitely not worth it. And you kind of get a feel for, for what makes sense for you. Um, but I would say the, the sooner you can get through and cut these things out, the better. And so again, I mean, I'm not trying to just say, you know, hey, look how fast I am. I want you to be fast. Um, and part of that obviously takes training, right? If you've been doing the LSAT for a very long time, hopefully you will not do the LSAT for 20 years like I've been doing, because why would you do that unless, you, <laughs> unless you're going to work with me? Um, but, uh, but you can train up over the course of even weeks or months to start to see some of these things a little more naturally without having to think about them um, as, as step by step. Okay. Let's get to some more of our principles. So another really uh, important thing beyond making predictions, which I think if I were going to say there's one that's the biggest thing, the, the, the prediction part of the upfront work is probably the most important thing. Get used to knowing what you're looking for. If you know you're looking for a reversal, you, say, you save so much time because you're not getting hung up in the answers. I sometimes think of the answers as sketchy salespeople who are constantly trying to, to get you, who do you want to buy this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And if you don't know what you want, you can get really pulled into that. Whereas if you know really clearly what you're looking for, You've come to that store for a purpose. You know, you've got your mask on. <laughs> you want to get in there and get out. Um, it's a lot easier to to save yourself trouble. And so, having a really strong prediction when you can have one is really important. You have to have some humility. You have to know when you don't know, and that's important too. Um, but uh, but trying to predict is is probably one of the biggest elements of of success for for most people, even when we don't do it well. Um, other big principle, recognizing bad answers. Um, how do I know an answer is bad? It's obviously all relative. Um, you could say it's as simple as it's not good, right? It's not what I want. But we can also spot some general tendencies of answers that make them less likely. So a few general principles to think about. On logical reasoning, get used to cutting the impossible and deferring on the unknown. And this could apply to all topics, really. Um, but the idea would be, if I know something can't happen in the game, oh, Sanders can't be on Tuesday, or you know, I know I have to have W before T, so I can't have this particular answer, cut that. If you, have, if you look at something and say, maybe, let me test that out. Before you test it out, move on and defer. If there's only one left that, that isn't impossible, then you don't need to prove it because that's the answer. If there are two, then you can decide where to test, or maybe you have some previous work or some other way of, of checking it. So in other words, it gets to, what, to our final principle, which is avoid unneeded work. Don't spend a lot of time confirming something if it turns out it's the only one that's possible. So get in, get in the habit of moving on, and deferral is a big part of getting better. If you think of that as a failure, oh, I don't understand this, I don't know whether this is right, then you're going to be less likely to do it. If you think of it as part of success, yes, I'm going to choose intentionally sometimes to move on and see whether I need to do this work, then uh, you're going to be much more likely to do it. On inference questions, whether that's in reading comp or LR, um, know your tendencies. Be cautious with extreme answers. Um, an extreme answer isn't necessarily wrong. Maybe I've proven something. Maybe it says, you know, uh, whatever, uh, all mammals nurse their young and cheetahs are mammals. Then you know all cheetahs nurse their young. Um, that, that would have to be a fact. Right? Um, extremes can even, can even play out in cases where they might seem unreasonable. Do all cheetahs nurse their young? What about male cheetahs? What about baby cheetahs? Well, okay, you know, but maybe they mean the species as a whole, but, but whatever follows from that, uh, we have to run with it. So extremes can be right, but we have to be cautious. And in general, with an inference, the weaker the statement is, the more likely it is to be right. Think of the difference between um, a statement like this, um, I am the fastest runner of all time versus I am a faster runner than Joe or if I race Joe, I might not lose. Notice we're getting less and less ambitious. Fastest runner of all time 
That's just not a reasonable answer. That's not just extreme, it's impossible. How would I ever know as the fastest runner of all time unless it was just written in stone from the heavens, right? Um, maybe right now there's someone, maybe I won the Olympics or whatever, I broke the world record, but maybe there's someone in some village somewhere who can run twice as fast as I can. Or maybe there was someone who lived a thousand years ago who could run a little bit faster than I can. We just, there would be no way to know that. Um, faster rather than Joe, easier to prove, but uh, we'd have to be careful. Am I always faster? Does it depend? If I race Joe, I might not lose. That's almost impossible to be wrong. Joe could be super, super fast and I could be super, super slow, but I might not lose. Maybe Joe will let me uh, catch up. Maybe Joe will, will die, I don't know. Um, whatever it is, right? Something could happen. That's an answer that's, it would be unreasonable to cross out. It pretty much has to be true. I might not lose unless I know somehow that I must. Um, so unreasonable answers wanna go. Extreme answers may or may not be right. Um, for general RC um, and for some LR, we wanna to stick to the scope. So if we have a main point question, or a purpose question, we wanna make sure that it's covering the, the broad scope of, of the passage. And we don't wanna rule things out um, because they're, they're vague. We do wanna rule things out that are, that are true, but just dealing with one part. We also wanna think about the kind of argument they're making. So if they're making an argument about cost, we don't want to weaken it with an answer about ethics, for instance. If I say it would be cheaper to outsource a project, you can't weaken that by saying, well, that's not nice to our employees or something like that. I just said it would be cheaper, not that we should do it. Whereas, whereas if I say that we ought to do something, then we could bring in the ethics of it, right? So know what the scope of the argument is, know what's admissible and what's not. Um, also know when to cut extremes. Does anyone have an example of, an, of a question type where we do not want extreme answers? We talked about inference, but where else? Where else would we not want an extreme answer? Main point, sure. If, if the author is like mildly disapproving of something, we don't want to think, say that they hate it, right? Um, must be true. Yeah, we could, we could have an extreme answer on a must be true because it can be conditional. But there are some must be true questions where we're looking for, if it has to be true, I want to, I want to be sure not to overstate my case. Necessary assumptions are one of the most common places outside of inference where we're looking out for extremes because we're looking for what's needed. And so if I'm trying to strengthen an argument and I find out that like X is impossible or that you know every customer prefers Y to X or something like that, then great. But if I'm trying to make an assumption, right? If I say, you know, X may not make a profit, I don't need to assume that everyone hates it. I just need to assume that, you know, not everyone will love it or not everyone will buy it. And that's a really important difference. Um, so there are cases where like strength and weekend or principle or sufficient assumption where extremes are great. And there are other cases where extremes are a huge liability. We also want to go from abstract to concrete as much as we can. You've probably seen these ones, say a flaw question where they say, um, mistakes uh, an element which is sufficient with one which is necessary, that's a reversal. But you'll see things that it might be more, more detailed than that. Um, confuses a situation where a given outcome is likely to produce a certain result with one in which a certain result is likely only to have come from a specific outcome or something like that. And you're like, wait, what's the result? And what's the outcome they're talking about? What, what are those words? Or they'll say uh, that the author evaluates Two, uh, two types of phenomenon and categorizes them uh, with regard to uh, three metrics or something like that. Well, what are those phenomena? What are those metrics? Is that really happening? So see if I can match that to language in the passage. Don't let it stay abstract longer than necessary, right? If there are ways I can pass up some of the abstract answers entirely, then great. But if I'm going to tackle them, I don't want to just read those words over and over again and waste my time. I want to be able to, to uh, to recognize the abstract terms and how they map to the passage. Okay, let me get you guys exercising again. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you four questions, but I'm not gonna give you the text. So the top two are from reading comp, the bottom two are from logical reasoning and it has the citations at the bottom. Um, but what I want you to do is for each answer, uh, sorry, for each set of answers, think about what the most unlikely answers are. So on most of these, we could probably reasonably cut in the neighborhood of two answers that just are the least likely, that just don't seem probable. And this is very important. Imagine, let's say you were given the option to take the LSAT plus, and the LSAT plus would be one where instead of having five answers, you just have three answers for each question. 
that sounds good, right? Now, what if additionally they said, oh, but we're, we're going to score you just like the regular LSAT. So you won't be, you won't be normed against other people who have three. You're going to, you know, <laughs> you're just basically paying for a higher score because you're going you're gonna to get more right. You'd obviously want that. Right? Now, there is no such thing as that, but we can create that a lot of time by getting used to spotting the answers that don't make sense. And one of the reasons I'm able to say, get through the first 15 LR in 15 minutes is that a lot of times I'll look at an answer and go, no, never. it's not even worth considering. It's not even close. Um, and that makes your job so much easier, right? Let's say I showed you again, five pictures, which one of them is me? Well, maybe you haven't seen me that much and you're, you know, is that guy kind of looks like him or is that his brother or something like that? But you might see, you know, an old lady and say, well, that's not him. Right, I, I know that, I don't have to spend time going, well, do they have the same mole or, no, it's not, that's not me. Um, and so the, the sooner we can cut some things out, the easier it gets. So let's take a couple minutes to, uh, to try these. I'll ask you to pull in just any letter uh, when you are ready to discuss these. I'll stop us in a couple of minutes if, uh, if I've heard from most people, but just, I'll just actually just pull in A when you're ready to discuss these four. Um, obviously, you're not gonna just know the answer unless you've done these before. I'm not expecting you to know the right answer. I'm not even expecting you to try. That's not a reasonable task. But pull in an A when you're ready to talk about these four because you feel like you've knocked out some good answers, okay? Or some bad ones, I should say. Here we go. Okay, I know I didn't give you a lot of time, but let's talk about these. Um, so go ahead and use the chat for, for number 23 first. Um, type in your least favorite answer choices, whether it's one, two, three, even what are your least favorite answers? Just give me the letters of your least favorite. Which of these seem really unreasonable? Even though presumably most of us have not read this passage. If you want to read it later, this is Preptus 65, passage three, or section three, uh, the, the last passage, I should say. Okay, I'm seeing A, C, E, A, E, C, B, D, that's all of them. Okay, so a lot of people don't like A, right? Yeah, cannot grow. It's not impossible without reading it. We don't know. It is not the answer, but it's, it, it's not in theory impossible. They could have said something like, uh, thistles only grow in topsoil and so if we replace topsoil it cannot grow but that would be it because it's any soil we use to replace topsoil how would we know thistles cannot ever grow i mean what if it's some soil we've never even heard of before it's very hard to imagine that that would be true right it's very hard to imagine it's almost an impossible answer e seems extreme it was never used how do i know that any soil we use to replace topsoil will never have been used why do what if someone did one that had been used. That's kind of a guess, okay? So notice what we have left. 
we have some very negative statements. It does not. But notice it says it does not contain significant amounts. And this says contains very few. Those really mean the same thing, don't they? Right? I don't mean they're talking about the same concept, but they have the same kind of level of truth. Um, one is saying not a lot, and the other is saying very few. So in terms of, of extremeness, B and C are identical. Um, and then you see D, same thing, does not contain large amounts. So B, C, and D are talking about different things, fungi, grasses, and herbs, and fertilizer. To know which one's right, we would have to go to the passage. There's no way to really tell which of those is right without going back. But they're, they're interchangeable in terms of how extreme they are, um, whereas A and E are much less reasonable. Do we see that? All right, now 26 is from the same passage. Um, put in your least favorite answers there. What seem like the sketchiest answers? C, D, E, D, E, D, okay. Um, yeah, this is interesting. The number of all types of beneficial microorganisms, all types, every single type of microorganism that's beneficial there is. I mean, there's untold millions potentially of these, right? All types would increase. That seems very certain. Yeah, I don't like that one. Um, interesting thing, some of you were picking on E and some weren't. One thing to watch is increase proportionally. That might not seem extreme. That's very extreme because it implies that that's simply what will happen. Like what if we all agreed that say um, smoking is more likely to cause lung disease, right, than not smoking. But if I said, if you cut down on your smoking, your risk of lung disease will decrease proportionally. That might make sense. Less smoking, less risk. But do we know that it's proportional? For instance, do we know that someone who smokes half as much has half the risk? Maybe not. Maybe after a certain point, your risk doesn't change that much, right? Just like if I knew that you studied half as much, I don't need to know that you'd get half the score. Maybe that doesn't make sense. How could you get a, you know, if I get a 160, how could you get an 80 or something like that, right? So it doesn't, we don't always know when they say things are proportional, we don't always have that very specific information. Anything else that seems really strong? Yeah, some people aren't liking B, right? Um, and yeah, I, I think that there's there's grounds to object to that as well, um, because they're saying uh, that they would be unable, and it's like not just thistles, but anything like thistles. There could be all sorts of unwanted plant species. There could be some Martian plant that could come down and survives anywhere. So unable to survive is very strong, especially since it just says like these. That leaves us with A and C. And notice that these are saying something a little milder. Um, would increase could, in C could sound very certain, but it says the chance of survival would increase. So that's very different. Like imagine the difference between me saying, you're gonna win the lottery. Whoa, really? How do I know that, right? I must be cheating. Versus if you buy more tickets, your chance of winning will increase. Well, sure, right? Um, that makes sense, but it doesn't mean you're gonna win. Um, populations would initially decline. That's a very specific assertion. I need to check against the passage, but specific doesn't make it wrong. I'd have to look and see if it's right. Okay, cool. Uh, give me your least favorite on the bottom left here, uh, the, the, the fish one. C, yes, C is, is really talk about toxic, it's terrible. It's saying these things do not harm fish, which could be fine in any way other than this one, right? So in other words, they're saying that something causes a problem and nothing else causes that problem. So be careful about no other mechanism. This in a sense relates to our idea of, of um, illegal reversal. Um, the idea of, well, wait a minute, if I know that X causes harm, do I know that if harm, then X, that there's no other source of harm, right? Um, this, and D sounds like an illegal negation, right? Um, it sounds like they probably said nutrient-rich sewage causes algae proliferation. So do we know that they won't proliferate if there's not nutrient-rich sewage? Oh, I don't know that actually. 
um, that would be very unlikely. Um, e sounds pretty strong, the death of most of the fish, but notice it says can result. So it can happen, right? Um, this is just a comparative, reproduce more quickly. Um, and this is generally more likely to die than are these others. So again, it's a comparative. We do have to watch out and see if we have the support for comparatives, but at least this makes some sense. Okay, last one. What seems least reasonable on this one? I'm seeing A, A, and E. So this is an interesting one. A is super strong. West Nile will never be a common disease. How would we know that? Right? Notice B is comparative. C is a sum. Sum, remember, if you've studied this before, sum just means not none, not zero. Right? So, you know, um, some people are me. <laughs> Technically, yeah, I am. All right, that's somebody. I'm not nobody. Um, so sum is a pretty low bar. Um, more people here than there, again, comparative. E is very strong, was not carried, absolute certainty. Um, interesting fun fact on this one, E is the right answer. Why am I telling you this for a problem we haven't done? Because I do want to acknowledge that it's not a simple matter of finding the mildest statement. In this case, the strong statement E was the right answer. Can we tell that from looking at it? No, no. So there are cases where a strong answer is justified and we have to watch out on inference questions if we have strong support, we can have a stronger statement. So we don't want to, to immediately eliminate. And that's why I was saying earlier, be cautious with, with uh, extreme statements or strong statements, um, slash the ones that are actually unreasonable that we couldn't know, right? Um, if, I, if I'm talking about something that happened in the past, I do have to be careful. Um, how do I know how West Nile got here exactly? But maybe we do know if that's fairly recent. If I try to make a, an extreme statement about you know, ancient history or something, that might be even more speculative. Do I really know that for sure? How would I know? Okay, um, so that's something to watch. Um, we're near the time, but I, so I'll speed up a little bit on the last couple of principles, but I do wanna to touch on these. If folks found this stuff helpful, definitely let me know. And what I'm thinking of doing is following up and creating some maybe part two or three of this uh, eventually, this will all be up on YouTube, and so um, we could flesh some of this out and do some additional problems to build on these principles if people find them helpful in their work. Uh, but let me touch on the other two, uh, other two big areas. So one is uh, avoiding unneeded work. Um, this is what I sometimes call being efficient slash lazy, right? Um, uh, you know, I'm as lazy as the next person I'd like to think. Um, and what I want to do is not do work I don't have to. It's a tricky line. I do have to work up front. I want to work hard, but I want to work hard to avoid more work later, right? And that's really important. So I don't want to make a shopping list when I go to the store, but I'd rather do that than wander the store aimlessly, try to remember what I needed or have to go, turn around and go back. Um, and so the same thing here. So some principles for avoiding unneeded work. Obviously, what I've said already implies all we've done before, front loading, making predictions, making inference is really important. Some other broad principles. First off, if you're unsure, defer. I mentioned this earlier, a big deal across the entire LSAT. If you're not sure if something's right or wrong, don't immediately feel the need to decide. Move on and see if you need to come back to it. Um, if you're dealing with a time-wasting answer choice or a time-wasting question, or even in some cases, especially if you're not trying to max out your score, a time-wasting entire passage or game, um, move on, guess, fill it in. And you can always cycle back if you have time. And if you didn't have time at the end, then aren't you glad you guessed because otherwise you would have run out of time on the entire test. So it's definitely something to watch out for. Don't feel the need to do everything. Just like you don't have to comply with everything everyone asks you to do or respond to every request or do every, every task, right? Uh, you take on every job. We don't have to do every question on this test, even when we're trying to do quite well. Uh, move on in some cases and, and, and you know, bow to practicality. On logic games, one really good principle to watch out for is taking a quick look at the answers on a particular question. Sometimes that means, oh my gosh, I've been working so hard and I knew this answer already. Like, what if I said, hey, I'm gonna give you a test about China, so uh, get ready, okay? I wanna see what you know about China. And you're there like studying Chinese history and stuff like that. And then the questions are like, what continent is China in? Name at least one language spoken in China, right? What letter does the word China start with? And you're like, oh, 
I took you know, I took three semesters of Chinese history to prepare for this test, and these are the questions, right? So sometimes we look at the answers and we're like, oh, I knew that two minutes ago. Why have I been working so hard? So at least glance at what we have. This can also help us choose more likely places to look. Um, one principle you've probably seen a lot if you've studied for a while is using previous work. Um, that's a really important reason to, to write some more things down. Some people do a lot of logic games in their head because they can. And certainly you have to weigh the pros and cons of writing more down. But one definite pro of writing stuff down is then you have a bank of previous work to look at. Um, it's also a good reason to go in order and say do the uh, orientation question first. So you have that at least one case as a previous uh, case to look at. Um, if you're trying to find a uh, could be true, then any previous work you've had is a could be true, unless it was a, you know, which of these can't be. Um, and if you're trying to find a must be true, um, you can use the, your previous ones to roll those out. So if they say what must be true, and one of them says, you know, Peter goes first, and you saw one where, you know, Catherine goes first, well, then it's not, it doesn't have to be true that Peter goes first. So you can rely on previous work that way. Um, don't test the answers if you don't have to. So if you can make a prediction, if you can jump straight to an answer, if you can skip some of the answers and test the ones that are more likely, um, then do that. Only test particular answers if that's the best way you have forward. On reading comp, a simple principle, don't try to understand everything. Don't try to get every concept. Um, a lot of people really get intimidated by reading comp passages out of their uh, comfort area. For many people, that's science. A lot of my students really don't like the science passages. They might find science interesting just you know, when, they're, when they're looking at it casually, but they're sitting there going, I don't know about neurotransmitters, or I don't know about you know, uh, neurotransmitter-gated ion channels in particular, or, or you know, the Big Bang, or whatever it is. But you're not supposed to know a lot. Maybe you've heard of these things. Maybe you know that neurotransmitters are in the brain, or you know a name of one. Great, right? Um, but we're not supposed to have all the concepts down. And again, if we know why something is there, then we don't necessarily need to know all the sp specifics, all the particulars until uh, we're asked about it. And we may never be asked about it. So you know, if, you're, if your professor is gonna give you a comprehensive exam on five chapters, then you need to be ready to answer anything in those five chapters. But if it's a quick open book thing and you have the text right there, maybe there's parts you don't need to study that deeply until you're asked about them. Um, in logical reasoning, um, getting back to the idea of deferring, make a quick first pass. Um, so sometimes you'll look at an answer choice and go, I don't see why that would matter. Um, and then it ends up being right. How many of you have had that experience, right? You're, the answer is like, what? They're talking about, I don't know, people's weight, but I thought the answer was about profits and what is, how, is, what is how much we weigh have to do with it or something like that. Um, so if something seems like it's totally irrelevant, you can cross it out if you know it doesn't fit, but you can also say, huh, I don't see why that would matter. Let me come back to it and let's see if I need a new idea. Often the right answer will be some kind of bridge between uh, the premise and conclusion that, that's predictable. Um, sometimes the right answer will also rule out an exception that we hadn't thought of, some other possibility. So if I say, oh, you know, my dad, is in Hawaii, he must have flown there. Well, I'm overlooking that maybe he took a ship or something like that. The ship wasn't mentioned in the passage, but it's an alternative to flying I didn't consider. Sure, fine. But I don't want to engage with those new ideas too soon if I don't need them. Sometimes the right answer might just jump out and then I don't have to think about that stuff. Okay, questions about this set? Okay, one last set of principles, and again, we'll, we'll hopefully flesh this out in, in, a, in a future session. Um, think in conditionals. And what I mean by this is not just learn conditional logic and learn to diagram, but getting back to what we talked about earlier, get so good that you can see that kind of reversal. Like CC saw it and said, hey, I, I, I can tell this is, this is an illegal reversal. Maybe that was fresher for you. Or seeing the difference between a, a negation and a reversal, um, or the difference between reversing something and it's contrapositive. Recognizing that when someone says only if, the only if thing is gonna be on the right side of the conditional, on the necessary side. This is really important. I want you to be able to see this even when you're not writing it out. That doesn't mean don't write it out, but even when you're not writing it out, get good at this. So a couple things. Um, make sure that you're good at diagramming and going by feel. Um, and one way is, is gonna support the other way. Um, if you think about, say, in logic games where we have a, uh, a logic chain method that we use where we create uh, columns and we draw conditionals that way. That's different from how we do conditionals in other places, but doing that makes me smarter and stronger about doing conditionals in other ways. And so interpreting conditionals by feel um, makes me better at doing it by rote, just the way you might have had with math, right? If I can estimate an answer, but I can also do the multiplication, those two support each other, right? I'm gonna catch my multiplication errors if they're at odds with my estimate, and I'm gonna get stronger at estimating from having done that technical work. 
And so the same thing applies to the LSAT. The conditional logic is one of the closest things we have in this test to math. And so that same kind of thinking applies. Um, when we see multiple conditionals, um, expect them to, to chain up. We might have to contrapose something, flip something around, move something, uh, but it's very common to see that. Just watch out for false change. Sometimes we want to have this um, x leads to y and y leads to not z or something like that. But what we actually have is x leads to y and no z leads to y. And so I can, I can get not y leads to, to z, but I can't get y leads to not z. I have to watch out. So sometimes I think I have a chain that I don't have. I have to watch out for that. But expect things to combine. And again, that's like math. If I gave you a couple of equations, you might expect you could get something out of putting those together. Same thing with conditionals. Do that up front. Do that work up front. Um, with logic games, basically, you're always going to die in conditionals. You don't want to just do them by feel unless they turn into a simple rule. Right. If you can, if you can get into the diagram and you can see, oh, there's only one way this works out, that would be a rare exception. But most of the time, you're going to write the conditionals out. You don't want to use conditionals for a frame. And the basic idea is that if I know that x uh, leads to y, I don't know what happens if I don't have x. So I know if 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 x is in, then y is in. Great. But what if I, x is not in? Eh, I don't know if y is in, so I can't really get a frame out of that. So be cautious about doing that. There might be very rare advanced cases where you can get away with that but be careful about that. A uh, question was about unless with these. Unless means if not. And so unless is it gonna end up usually being a necessary condition. Um, one way I think about uh, conditionals that can help me memorize these is I use a go-to case that I can use for anything I want. So the one I use typically is rain and clouds. So which conditional is right? Is it C to R or R to C? Which of those is correct? What's the true relationship between rain and clouds? If you think causally or temporally, like what came first or what led to something, then you would say, hey, uh, clouds cause rain. But we're not talking about cause, we're talking about conditional, right? We don't know that if there are clouds, there's rain. What we do know is if there's rain, there's clouds. The rain doesn't make the clouds, right? At least maybe it adds to it, but it doesn't make the clouds, right? If anything, it maybe dissipates the clouds. Um, but when there's rain, there's clouds. And you can see that through what we call the contrapositive. Can you flip in the gate? If there's no clouds, there's no rain. Whereas the other is not true. If I said if there's no rain, there's no clouds, that's actually not true. There's plenty of cloudy days where it doesn't rain. So these aren't right. Um, so I can use that to assess other statements like, oh, how would I use unless, right? It won't rain unless there are clouds, I can translate unless as if not, if no clouds, then no rain, or I can get used to the idea that the unless shows what's needed for this thing not to happen. So it won't happen that it, I know this sounds crazy, it won't happen that it doesn't rain unless there are clouds. So another way of saying that is clouds are needed for rain. So getting used to having a case like that um, can be really useful. And you don't have to like rain and clouds, you could do whatever it is. Right. Um, as long as it's clear which way the the conditional works, and it only works one way. You don't want things that 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 go in both directions. Right. Um, you know, if I don't know, if maybe if maybe if uh, someone is my wife, then I'm her husband. But it goes both ways. Right. Um, here, we we only know that when it rains, it's cloudy. We don't know that it's cloudy. It's rain. It's not a biconditional, and so we want to recognize that. And you can use this for any. The only time it rains is when it's cloudy. Um, rain is a sure sign of clouds, right? Um, and so it, whatever, whatever conditional kind of statement you want, you can represent with this as long as it's a simple one-way conditional. Um, other principle for LR, know what puts something on the right or left, and that gets back to exactly what we we're talking about. Um, know whether something is, is a sufficient condition on the left or a necessary condition on the right. Um, get used to, to being able to do that contrapositive in your head and not even have to write it out, but, but do write it out, but be, also be able to manipulate in your head through, through repetition. Um, and know what you want at the end of the chain. And what I mean by that, and I'll, I'll uh, you know, end with that, I have already talked about this last one, is the idea that when they give you a conclusion, often they'll say, therefore, um, 
John is a paleomycologist, or therefore the, the plan will fail, or therefore it is laudable to do this action or something like that. We, we, we know what we want at the end, and so we know what we want to, to, to see in an answer choice. We want something that gets us to that on the right. So if I say something like, let's say the conclusion says, uh, therefore the company was at fault. We need, we need a, a principle, let's say, if this is asking for a principle that would support this, we need a principle that says, blah, 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 therefore at fault. And so if we say something like, a company is at fault when it does X, hey, that sounds good. Because it's saying, hey, if X, then at fault. But if one says companies uh, are at fault, uh, or sorry, companies that are at fault will do X. Now it's saying the opposite. It's saying, hey, if they're at fault, they're likely to do X. It's starting with the with the conclusion and trying to re to build on that, right? It's like if I'm trying to fi figure out if you're guilty. It's not going to help you to know if you're guilty, you'll be put in jail. Okay, but are you guilty? <laughs> this doesn't tell me. And it wouldn't allow me to find out. Even if you are in jail now, I don't know if that means you're guilty. Right? I only know the other way, that if you're guilty, you'll go to jail. Um, so watching out for that kind of thing, knowing what you want. And, and I've seen very hard matching or principle type questions where just knowing what I want on the right side of the arrow allows me to get rid of three of the choices really fast. So it's a, a really nice speed tip you can use. Okay, I better stop there. I'm sure some of you have places to go, uh, but I hope this was helpful. I, I saw a lot of you saying that we ought to do this again. So I'm, I'm hoping that next time I have a free pep hour, um, we'll, we'll pick up on this um, and add in some, some more specifics to, to, to some of these areas um, and, and, and build on that. So look for that in the future. Um, I'll, I will end by going to a recap of the, of the five principles, um, and then I'll also put up a, a link about our classes because I know someone asked about that. So feel free to stick around if you have questions. Other than that, thank you so much for coming to the, uh, to the session and hope uh, your LSAT goes really well. Thank you very much. Here's the link to check out our new classes. We always have new classes listed. Uh, this says in-person. We're not gonna have in-person classes for a while, so I should have updated that. Um, but, uh, but who knows, by the time you're watching this on YouTube, hopefully we're all gonna be back to normal again. That would be great. Um, so uh, check us out and uh, hope to see you around. Thanks very much.